Hello, I'm Judith Roger, and I'm talking about what makes Greg Kernow's art Canadian. Since Kernow loved making lists, I'm beginning with my own list. Is it because Kernow painted himself as a cheeky Canadian? Is it because he played lacrosse with his friends? Is it because he refused to exhibit his works in the United States? Is it because he was chosen to represent Canada in international exhibitions? Is it because he co-founded the Association for the Documentation of Neglected Aspects of Culture in Canada? Is it because of his activism in support of Canadian artists? Is it because he was a founding member of the Nihilus Spasm Band? Is it because he designed a centennial cake with icing flavored with back bacon and maple syrup? <laughs> Is it because the curtains in his studio were printed with images of Louis Riel postage stamps? You can see them there. Is it because his Trans Canada pop bottle collection had over 175 bottle, bottles from regional bottlers across the country? The answer to each of these questions is yes. What else makes Greg Kernow's art Canadian? I have three suggestions. First, Kernow was a bread in the bone Canadian. Born not quite 80 years ago in the small city of London, Ontario, Colonel remained firmly rooted there. He never lived more than five kilometers from his family home, except for the three years he spent at the Ontario College of Art, where, incidentally, he was taught by Jock MacDonald. Colonel wrote, MacDonald encouraged many of the younger Toronto abstract artists. In my case, he was sympathetic, but he also confessed that he didn't understand what I was doing. Entirely Canadian trained, Colonel refused to consider moving to a larger center. While he was always cognizant of international trends, he not only drew in his own particular environment for his art, he celebrated it. His work is personal, specific, and Canadian. As Colonel explained, you cannot afford to ignore what's going on outside, but you must not lose sight of what's first. The things within hearing and seeing distance, that's where it all starts. There is a stink culture here as there is in regions all over Canada. It just needs articulate artists to bring it out. He became the center of a group known as the London Regionalists, Artists whose work, inspired by their own region, became nationally known in 1968 through the National Gallery of Canada traveling exhibition, The Heart of London. And you can see the comic book style catalog here. Secondly, Greg Colonel was fortunate with his timing. He rented a large studio in London in 1960, just one year before the Canada Council began nurturing the arts by giving grants directly to Canadian visual artists. By 1967, Colonel had received his first of 12 Canada Council awards that ranged from $2,500 to almost $42,000 in 1989. When he traveled from Halifax to Vancouver Island as a member of a Canada Council jury or as a visiting artist, he came to know Canada and its regions well. Kernow's art making responded to the great societal changes that were happening around him and in the wider world. In Canada, national pride and optimism were epitomized by a new flag, centennial celebrations, and Expo 67. There was much debate about Canadian identity and issues such as regionalism, versus nationalism or continentalism. Kernow's interest in politics resulted in frequent and often controversial articles in journals, public lectures, and letters to the editor. He used irony, humor, and deliberate provocation to raise awareness about his concerns. 
such as the influence of American, influx of American artists, cultural administrators, and academics, as well as the gradual erosion of Canadian culture. Colonel became known for promoting Canada's artists and for his anti-American attitude. Finally, some works with distinctly Canadian content. For Ben Bella from 1964 shows Curnow's iconoclastic, irreverent approach to Canadian history. Prime Minister Mackenzie King is being zapped in the arm by an electric vibrator. Text printed around the edge mock the trade deals King negotiated with the United States in the 1930s. The title links King with Ahmed Ben Bella, the 1960s Algerian revolutionary. Around the edges, uh, Colonel juxtaposes names, Mao, Castro, and Malcolm X with Diefenbaker, Riel, and Tecumseh. The work embodies Colonel's interest in national liberation struggles and his idiosyncratic political stance. What a surprising choice for inclusion in the Canadian Pavilion at Expo 67. The True North Strong and Free, and, uh, sorry, numbers one to five, is the first series of text-only works created with large rubber uppercase stamps. The statements in these works all refer to Canada. A few are somewhat cryptic, can cost less than drugs, did Chartier die in vain, Chartier was the mad bomber who unsuccessfully tried to blow up the chamber of the House of Commons in 1966. The text of the second painting resonated. It was soon used on the cover of the anthology Close the 49th Parallel, etc., The Americanization of Canada. Kernow also applied this phrase, close the 49th parallel, etc., in French and English to his favorite hand-built Canadian Mariposa racing bicycle, seen here in his full-scale watercolor painting of 1973. After taking up competitive cycling in 1971, Kernow soon began making portraits of his bicycle collection, as usual drawing on his life for his art. Greg Kernow is perhaps best known for his bicycle works. The ultimate irony is that Kernow was killed by a pickup truck in 1992, five days before his 56th birthday, while riding this very bicycle on a county road outside London. In March 1970, in Kingston and Windsor, Kernow created a stir at a conference when he read his amendments to John Boyle's manifesto that had raged against American cultural imperialism. Kernow's 37 amendments were deliberately humorous, xenophobic, and outrageous. That we, the citizens of the second largest country in the world, should sever all connections with the smaller country immediately south of us. <laughs> a 50-mile-high electric fence to be built along the old Canada-US border. Complete Canadian content in all computer memory banks. Columbia River to be turned off. His anti-American attitude is evident in this 1972 drawing on your left. Colonel reconceived the map of North America, eliminating the United States in a gesture typical of his sense of humor. He elaborated on this concept in a lithograph produced at Banff in 1989. Note the emphasis on islands, those bastions of regional culture, and the use of Inuit syllabics for Arctic communities. Finally, two of Kernow's text works from 1991 could only be Canadian, given the references to the Royal Bank of Canada and Adirondack. At the end of his career, Kernow, who had criticized American cultural imperialism, was forced to admit that he himself had benefited from British cultural imperialism. Kernow had stamped the names of his indigenous cultural heroes in his work throughout his career, but his interest in the original First Nation inhabitants of London became a major focus in 1991. A year earlier, he had begun tracing the history of his property, 
researching deeds and interviewing descendants of the European settlers who had owned his land. He made four large text works, such as deeds number two on the, uh, your left, listing the names of all the owners of his lot, beginning with his own name. He then began to wonder about the occupants of his land before the Europeans. Historians he consulted confessed to knowing nothing prior to the colonial period. Embarking on his own original exhaustive research, he consulted documents and archives and interviewed indigenous people. The last work in this series, Deeds Number no. 5 from August 1991, documents 10,000 years of the history of his lot, from the Paleo period to the number two surrender of the Ojibwa lands in southwestern Ontario in 1790. Kernow described his startling realization, we live in a culture where pre-existing cultures lived and live. They have survived in isolation from the culture of a city of London. They have been omitted, omitted from most books of local history. Kernow's personal epiphany presaged the current integration of Indigenous art with so-called mainstream art in the Canadian collections of institutions such as the Art Gallery of Ontario and the National Gallery of Canada. I believe Greg Kernow would have applauded this long overdue recognition of what makes art Canadian.